Yeah, let's get started. Uh, before today's lecture, any questions about homework? Any issues, any challenges with the environment? Okay, so the homeworks will get longer. This is, the first one is very much on the shorter side. So definitely get sort of longer uh, programming questions going forward. But uh, any issues with this one? Okay, all right, so that's a homework. And uh, for the project, again, it's a little bit early right now for you guys to decide what project you wanna do. Uh, you have a better idea, let's say, in two or three more lectures, right? So the idea is for you to figure out a topic that you're, you're interested in, then talk to me and I'll suggest some data sources and suggest you know possible projects that you can do. So as we move forward, you'll see more applications and uh, you can think of you know, something you want to explore. And then we'll look at, you know, one, can you find the data? Two, is it feasible to do within the time span of a quarter? And then see what we do you know, going forward for the project. Okay. But very much, so you will select your own project topics. If you really cannot find one, I'll suggest something. But the idea is for you to sort of be more proactive and find topics. Okay. Questions for that, for project? Okay, all right, so that's uh, for projects. So today our goal is to look at regression or we'll get started on regression. Regression is a very large topic of uh, data science. This is basically for us, you can think about how predictions are made as we run a regression. Okay, so this is used all the time. Uh, may seem simple at first, but actually is quite useful. You use it everywhere. It's really you know, in very, uh, even uh, in sort of very large systems, you still use regression. Okay? So for example, uh, I guess last week, right, there were some files from Twitter that was open sourced, and you look at the files. There are many predictions in Twitter, for example, detecting what kind of images you have, basically runs regression. So it'd be no more complicated in essence than what we do here today. Okay, so this is really the workhorse of uh, any sort of prediction uh, algorithm that we have. So we'll look at this, so we'll look at regression algorithm. So for the next uh, at least two weeks, this will be our focus. Okay, so we'll introduce regression, we'll go back and uh, do a little bit more basics about power systems. And but then we'll, so, uh, especially in your homeworks, you'll see a lot about regression. And regression is basically a fancy name for the following. So it's a fancy name for data fading or Making prediction, the idea is these, the idea is this, is that let's say you care about something, let's say you have X as your observations. Okay, so you observe something, we're gonna call this X, you observe, uh, make a bunch of some observations. Y is your alpha. So it's something that you want, based on these observations, you want some idea of what the output will be. So in power system, the typical example is following is X. It's for example, this is weather, this is time of the day, this is for season, seasonal, Y is the load, right? So the idea is that you're given, these are the observations you can make. What you want to predict, what you want the output to be is you want to tell me what the load will be. Okay, so you draw this, you think of this as a box. You put X into this box. This is a regression. This is the code that you write. And then I'll comment some Y comes up. Okay, that this is basically what you want to do, right? So given the weather, all the information, you tell me what the load is. 
So this is the operational view of regression, right? So I have some input, I have some, some output, and I want, given x, I want you to tell me what y is. So if you really look at this in a rigorous way, what this really says is, right, even if I give you all this information, load is not exactly deterministic. Okay, so this is sort of pretending there is a function directly relating x to y. This is not always the case, right? Even given everything, your load, you may not be able to know the load exactly. Okay, so the low may be 100 megawatt plus minus one, right? So there is, may not be an exact function relating x to y. So really, if you want to be really rigorous, we should, the way you should think about this is what really happening is you have a probability of observing y given the information you have in x, right? So you really rigorously is what you care about is a conditional probability of where your load is, given all this information you have about you know you, the sort of features you think the load depends. Okay, so this is what really you're doing, right? So idea is you won't have a function that predicts the exact value. Okay, there's no function that tell you what the load is tomorrow exactly, right? Down to the last kilowatt, you always have some error, and the error comes from you have a probabilistic model. There's a probability of the function capturing this. Okay. So this is part to model. This is conditional probability. Okay, so this conditional probability, this is actually very hard to think of. This is quite difficult to get really a handle on this conditional probability, especially if you haven't done sort of probability or statistics, it's hard to think of. So the way we'll think about this as the following, we'll think y is some function of x plus some error. Okay. So the way we think of regression is, let's say that there is some function that relates x to y, and then you have some leftover air that you just, this is just random air. There's nothing you can do about this air. Okay, so you have some random air that is left over. Then there is some function relating x to y. Okay. And the regression problem is basically given x1, y1, the past observations you have, find f. Okay. So suppose that really x is related to y this way. You want to find this function relating to x to y given some observations you made in the past, right? So for low forecasting, you know the weather, you know the temperature, you know all this information, you observe the load, you observe all this past load. And then the goal is to say, how well can I forecast? How well can I find the future law? Okay. Right. So those are the... Uh, Fun, this is the idea of finding this function. Right? So this is basically what regression is. Regression thing is you have this input output data, this pairs of data. You want to find some relationship relating x to y, and your goal is come up with ways to find this relationship. Any questions about this? We'll see basically how to do this. Right? Okay, so. Again, if you get really fancy, you what you try to make is try to make a probabilistic forecast. We won't get that fancy in this class. Our goal is to say the noise, again, you don't control this noise. What you do is you, you find this function. Knowing that you will never find a function that perfectly explains the data. Okay, so it's very difficult to perfectly explain the data. You don't want that sort of function, right? You want a function that can explain the data, with some error. Okay, you don't want the perfect explanation. Okay, so again, normally if you have probabilistic meaning, you take probability, prob you know, have some probability to it. Often you don't have this kind of probabilistic interpretation. It's okay, we just use the same tools. It's not all that sort of uh, more challenging to use the same tools here, okay? And uh, the, 
this picture really shows to give an idea. So simplest is this is for simplest picture we can do. Right? So in this picture, we can have us think of this as x, this is y. So every dot here is a x, y, right? Have a coordinate. You're basically saying as I give you this bunch of dot, how does x relate to y? Yeah, so you have this sort of uh, you have a question you can ask us given this is x measurement, this is y, you observe how are they related to each other. Right? Find a function that uh, relates x to y. Okay. So in this case, it's a pretty uh, obvious function. So it's linear, right? So you can draw a line through it. So this is the idea is this is roughly linear, but there's some noise around this line. Okay, so the roughly linear function, there's some noise around it. Uh, you go is to find the slope of this function. Okay, so the slope and the intercept of this linear function. Okay. Any questions here? Okay. So the key thing for this kind of fitting, when you're looking, looking at this kind of fitting is often comes down to you want to say, there's many lines that goes through this. There's many lines here. There's a notion of the best fit, right? What is the best fit I can get? What is the most optimal fitting I can get? That very much dependent on how you measure optimality. Okay, when you say, what is the best fit? The question is always, what is your error measure? How do you measure distance? How do you measure the error? What do you mean by best? And even in that study, even for linear, there's many, many ways to define distance. For example, you can define it as if you align the distance is really sort of the perpendicular distance, right? the closest, or your distance to the line measured this way. You don't have to do it. You can have a distance that just measures the vertical axis, not the perpendicular distance. Right? So this is a perfectly fine norm. This is a norm. This is a norm. You have many, many other norms you can have. And uh, using different distances actually matters quite a bit on the result you will get. So often your trick of what happens for regression is not so much, now of course we'll learn this here, we'll look at the equations, not so much the equation you get, is understanding what's the difference of using dif different distance metrics. There's questions, different questions you ask. Well, you should use one metric versus the other metric. Okay. So you want to use different distance metrics. So to, right, to give you idea with different metrics is the following. For example, we can have low forecasting. For low forecasting, your metrics are normally so-called L2 distance is how well can I forecast a low subject to a square error, right? So this is often as you try to minimize. So what are you trying to minimize? You minimize over the function that you have control of. The summation of all the data you have seen, you score this. Okay, so low forecasting, this is called a square norm. This is saying that you want a best fit where the error is measured where you square the sort of your prediction versus the actual measurement. Okay. So this is a perfectly sort of reasonable norm to work with, right? You can square this. However, this is not the only norm you can work. Right? So through this class, we'll also explore many other this kind of forecasting problems. For example, there's a, Common problem is called topology estimation. Okay, so topology estimation says the following. It's basically, let's say I have a network. Okay? And uh, what happens is I give you some measurement. So I have some, let's say, voltage measurements, right? Voltage measurements, V1, V2, V3, some power measurements. Four, four. Okay, so 
what happens is I go to all these places, I measure the voltage, I measure the power of the generating and so on. Now you, you can ask the question is, what is the topology of this network? Okay, how are, for example, is there a line here between these two? How are these things connected? What are the possible topologies of this network? Okay, so your only question is, you know, maybe the network is connected Right, so maybe the network is connected this way. It could be possible. This could be a sort of pentagon connection. Maybe the network, let's say, could be connected in a tree. One, two, three, four, five. Okay, both are possible connections. So your goal is to figure out which of this is true. Okay, for power system operations, you often want to know what does my network actually look like? Is it this or is it this one? Okay. Right. So last time we uh, gave some reason why we don't know this. Again, you may think we should know this, but for distribution system, we actually do not know this. Anyone remember the reason why we don't know this? Like, why do you have to estimate your network? Right, so one reason is one is not documented well, right? We don't document. So there's some physical lines out there, uh, but uh, we don't have computer documentation, so we don't actually know. There's many other reasons. One is we'll see later in the classes, you may not know the fate that these nodes are on. So for the people who have taken power systems, power system is a three phase system. Most distribution networks operate as a single, single or two phase. You may not know actually which is this A, B, or C phase. You may not know this. There's a lot of switches in the system that opens and closes all the time. You may not know the status of the switches and so on. So it's not actually uncommon to not know what the topology is. Okay? So it's very expensive. We're going to figure out what the topology is. Some places, the wires are buried underground. Those are really hard. Even with the wires are overhead, the way to do it is basically you pay some engineer to physically go and look at all the wires. Okay, so those are expensive or sort of labor intensive things. It's much easier to install some uh, sensors. Right? So these sensors nowadays cost like 50 cents each one. You install some sensors, measure all the data. The question is from the data, can I figure out what the network topology is? Right, so later, again, we'll look at this question in more detail. But here, the way you will fit is actually different. Here, the fit is you want to minimize. So you're minimizing over the topology, right? So there's all kinds of different topology. You want to say which topology explains my uh, data the best. Okay, so this is your minimizing. Here, you're actually minimizing over the one norm, not the two. Turns out two norm is not a very good metric for solving this kind of problem. If you minimize the two norm, what happens with, is the problem will tell you everything is connected to everything. You don't want that to happen. The network is not every bus is connected to every bus. So you minimize the one. Turns out if you minimize the one norm, what happens is this will produce so-called a sparse solution. This will promote sparsity and you get a network that makes more sense. Okay, so all of this, this the entire difference comes from the objectives of the minimization problem. This thing matter. Okay, so again, nowadays the challenge is not with writing the algorithm. All of this is single line command. You type somewhere and uh, we'll tell you what the answer is. For us now, the challenge is mostly finding the right objective to put into the problem. Can okay, you put in the right objective into the problem? Okay, so this one norm gives sparsity. This is actually, you know, if we have a one here, sparsity, right? So these are all, so we'll cover what different the formulas for different norms and stuff. But the reason behind this is actually quite deep. Okay, so in this class, we won't have enough math to really understand why, you know, why sort of one promotes sparsity, yeah, under what condition is it actually sparse? 
but we'll try a bunch of examples to see what happens in these ten different metrics. Okay, so this actually matters way more than you know. Do you know how to solve the optimization problem? At least in some practical setting, and sort of why, what kind of norm should you use, okay, and what difference does it make? Okay. okay any questions for this? Okay, so if you look at this problem, let's say you go back to this low forecasting, you're minimizing or a function, right? Minimizing or a function that you want to minimize this uh, least square. How do you minimize over a function? Right, does it make sense to minimize over a function? So here I wrote mean over f, right? minimizing over the function of that uh, you know, minimizes as sort of square, right? So one, does it make sense? Two, if it makes sense, how do you actually do this? Anybody know how a function is being minimized over? So the question, right? So you look at this thing, right? This is minimizing over a function. Now you want a function that makes this thing as small as possible, right? I gave you some x1 pairs. I said, give me a function that for all the data I gave you, makes this sum of this sort of squares as small as possible, right? So I'm minimizing, I want you to give me this function, right? This object is what you're trying to be minimizing over, right? You're searching over. So this frees us. Look at all functions. Pick one that minimizes this sum of scores for me. That's a question. Okay. So one, does it make sense to how you do this? So how do you normally minimize stuff in calculus? I think remember back to calculus, you asked, I'm sure you have all been asked to minimize stuff. How would how do you actually minimize something? Sorry? Find the limits? Not the limits, right? Find the derivative, right? So normally when you ask to optimize something, you find a derivative, set the derivative to zero, solve for that thing, and that's what you get, right? If you ask to minimize a function, you cannot do this. Okay, one, this is extremely difficult, right? I'm asking you to search all functions. So all functions live in an infinite dimensional space, right? It includes literally all functions. That's not something that we can optimize over. For most problems, you cannot optimize over all functions. That's way too large of a class to, to be asked. Secondly, even if you could optimize all, all functions, this often is not a sensical question to ask because there is a trivial function that will minimize this for you. Your trivial function is basically saying, if you see xi, just output yi. I can give you this trivial function. Your trivial function now is just a list of numbers. It's a lookup table saying, if you see this one, give me this thing. If you see this one, give me that thing. Okay. So one is asking of my normal functions is one impractical, two sort of trivial. Right. So it's either it's both very hard or very easy. It's very hard, you're searching for many, many things. It's very easy. You can just give me a lookup table that uh, describes this to your relationship exactly. That lookup table is entirely useless. Okay, so to make that clear, so that's the important thing to remember is all from why, how we go about min minimizing. Okay. So to make that clear, is let's say you get a bunch of numbers. Okay, one, two, two pi, three e to the pi, four, uh, 7.5, okay? So I'm gonna make up numbers for you right now, okay? So the question is this asking you, so okay, can you minimize over a function such that one minus function, so this is, so this is the, so these are the x, y pairs, right? So two minus function evaluate one,
Okay, All right. So this right, you see this is a perfectly valid regression call. As I give you some x and y, as you can you find a function relating x to y. And then this is find me this f that minimizes this thing. Okay. There is a trivial solution to this. Namely, you just draw a table that says a follow. Right. So there's a trivial solution. G, right? So let you split and say F is the following table. If you see one alpha two, if you see two alpha pi, if you see three alpha e to the pi, if you see four alpha seven point five. This table of this function described by this table solves this problem exactly. Okay, right? every term is zero, this solves it. This is a perfectly good function. This is well-defined function that solves this problem exactly. This is also a useless solution because what do you want to do, right? So you have this function, you're doing low forecasting. You basically want to forecast what the load is tomorrow. So I can ask you the following question. What is the function of, let's say, five? Your table is now useless. Yeah, your table is useless. It doesn't, has nothing to say about it. Right. Okay, so when you're minimizing this kind of problem, it's important to avoid trivial solutions, right? You want to avoid something that fits this too well. That means your function is too complicated. Yeah, it's too much looking too much like a lookup table. So it's not very useful for prediction. Okay, so you want to limit how sort of how complicated this function is. So if it's not complicated enough, you may not be fitting very well. If it's too complicated, you're actually fitting too well. It doesn't generalize. Okay, so you have to make a choice of what this function looks like. Okay, what this function looks like. And the choice we often make, or at least the first choice we also often make, is we make a linear assumption. So okay. almost always what you try is you say, well, you know, my function is linear. Okay, so instead of optimizing over a function, now you basically find two numbers A and B and try to minimize the distance between this line to all these points. Okay, so this is one example of a function you can pick. Right, so regression, this is linear regression. Linear regression says that you want to minimize the distance from the, uh, you know, from X to Y, and you just assume there's a linear relation between X and Y. Okay, so now instead of optimizing over all functions, you're basically optimizing over these two numbers, A and B. This you can optimize. This is the calculus problem. You can take a derivative with respect to A, take a derivative with respect to B, set to zero, and find the best A and B. Okay, so this is a first year calculus problem if you assume this one. Okay. Okay, so any questions about this linear regression or regression? Yeah, so this is linear regression. You can have this in higher dimensional problem, right? So if it's not two-dimensional, your linear function is just a you know, matrix times x plus a multiple. Right? So it doesn't have to be uh, that doesn't have to be scalar. So, right. So it can be in whatever dimension you have. And uh, you can have this kind of thing. Right? So the next homework, right? So we're going to be asking to do a lot of this kind of study. Right. So the easiest function we can fit is a linear form. Right. So this may not you know, fit terribly well, but still, it's a, something we can try. Okay, any questions? Okay, so linear regression is so well developed, or it's our sort of patients, patients are stuck. Uh, devoted to this, right? Then the thing to recall is even though linear regression looks very simple, right? Even though linear regression looks, you know, extremely simple, y is ax plus b, actually you can't miss a very powerful method. The reason it's very powerful is you can basically introduce different terms here. Well, linear regression essentially is saying it's linear. The linearity comes from the fact that you're just optimizing over A and B. 
Yeah, we're just optimizing over A and B, right? So it's a it's lean, there's some parameter A multiplied by some X features. So even, so it doesn't, the data doesn't need to be linear. So this is an example showing you some data that's not linear, but you can still fit. If you introduce more complicated terms, you can introduce in square terms, okay? So there's no restriction to say that you have to be a times x. A can multiply other functions of x. You can introduce x squared, x cubed, x all the e to the x, all the things into it. Okay, so this is the, uh, right? So as long as it's just some coefficient multiplied by these things, this is still linear. It's linear in the coefficient. It's linear in beta one, beta two, beta three, so. Okay, so it's linear in those things. Yeah, this is, this is quadratic, right? So this is quadratic. But the good thing to remember is, what are you optimizing? When you solve this, you're finding this beta one, beta two, you're finding these two numbers. It's linear in these two numbers. It's linear in the coefficient. Okay, so this can be quadratic. This can be whatever you want. As long as you don't see a beta two square here, or beta one times beta two, then it's okay. That has to be linear in the weights, linear in the coefficients of the problem. Okay. And the really the idea is following is right. So if you have this kind of functions, x, you know, equals ax plus b or higher dimensional, what you have is you can have is y equals to so this higher dimensional w times x plus say an offset, right? So you could have a matrix notation. So here this is say higher dimensional and so when you what you really want to find this we want to find right so you want to find this matrix and this offset to explain your data right given access to what you want to fit y with and there's nothing restricting you to only use x you can use whatever other things that has to do with that. So, right, so what we can do is we can define features. We can define features of X, right? We can have define things like, so this is normally written as a phi. This is Greek letter phi of X. And then you can think of Y as B times X plus an offset. Okay, so you don't have to use the raw data. You can process. This is basically saying that you're gonna pre-process this data and to get into a more useful form of the data, to get into more useful. And then take that and uh, do a, so get a more useful data, more useful form, take that and do prediction based on this. Okay, so this is often how you use data. So again, giving an example in low forecasting, right? So let's say, again, so useful function is, this for example is low forecasting. So, so what, let's say we have temperature So let's say your observation, let's say X is your temperature, Y is your load, okay? So I'm, I want to relate temperature to load, for example, okay? So one thing you can use is you can use uh, raw temperature, right? You can use just sort of uh, temperature measure, just measure temperature to predict load. So that's one thing. Can you think of some processing on temperature you may do, right? Maybe make, uh, Predicting load a little bit easier. Often the challenge with temperature is temperature can be negative. Actually, that's a lot of times the challenge is using temperature. And if you can have negative temperatures. And if you have a linear regression, that may mess up your algorithm. Right? So if you just use temperature, for example, you just use raw temperature, and you have say y is ax plus b, you can fit a perfectly fine uh, 
line through most temperatures. But let's say you got a very cold day and your temperature is negative. They actually may give you a negative load. Okay, just because it's linear, right? Just linear times a negative number. So you may just get a negative load, which doesn't make sense, right? So can you think of some way to pre-process this? Maybe get it not so negative or not so. Absolute value is a little bit dangerous, right? You don't want, say, plus 10 degrees is definitely not the same as minus 10 degrees. So close, but not exactly as well. Okay, so you can start, uh, for example, so one question had to say that, okay, one thing you can try is to say that this is just a maximum between x and zero, right? So if x is negative, let's say it's zero, and say it's very close, something like this. That's one thing you can do. Are there other ideas? What do you do so much? Okay. You can use resistance. So that's a little bit uh, hard. No, that's hard. That's hard. That's right. Yeah, so you could do that. You could do that. But uh, there's other things. Right? So this is, for example, one, you know, one thing you can do is to say, if it's negative, let's not care about it. A normal trick that people figure it out is Fahrenheit is actually much better than Celsius. Because Fahrenheit is hard to go negative with Fahrenheit. I think in Seattle, you won't see you know, negative Fahrenheit temperatures most of the time. But people actually figure out if you use Fahrenheit, it's actually a better unit. The reason you will think these things are just, you know, what mat why does it matter what unit you use? Turns out it just go one negative numbers. So you can use Fahrenheit. What you can do is you can scale the data to just avoid negative numbers altogether, right? You can do, where you can take X to go to X minus a minimum, that's sort of you ever observe. Let's say this is the minimum is the number that you ever see. Okay, so this, for Seattle, let's say minus 10 uh, Fahrenheit, the right? so lowest you can possibly go. You can divide this by, Okay, so you can divide this by, uh, you can normalize this by the maximum minus the minimum. So what this does is normalize this thing to between zero and one. Okay, so this is the minimum number can go, this is the maximum time can go. So this is the number between zero and one. This is much easier to forecast using linear regression. And then say so you just take Celsius, that's an absolute, that's just reading from the Celsius. Okay? So this is a better thing you can do. There are other things you can do. There are sort of, you can try to center this. Sometimes this actually works. As you can take X to be X minus X, the average temperature you may expect to see in this time. You may expect to see this is the temperature. You can see that. Okay, so this is one sort of shaping you can have. So you can have more advanced shaping as what people observe is often that is if the temperature is within some range, the load is really not similar to the temperature. If the temperature is very high or very low, your load is very sensitive to the temperature. Right? So for a very hot summer day, one degree in, increase in temperature, your load becomes extremely sensitive because people really try to turn on AC, things like this. So there are functions where you can put X through this type of functions as sort of it doesn't, this were relatively flat and then sort of ramps up, right? So you want to exaggerate the changes in X when it gets very large or very small. You can do all those kind of tricks. Okay? So it doesn't have to be linear. You can shape X this way. There's many, many other things you can do. And this is what happens is to say that you don't need to just use the raw data itself. Most times, again, how well your algorithm does comes down to can you choose this thing? Yeah, so your next homework will be, you know, will give you a curve that's not linear and ask you to choose a feature or a basis that works. And for the homework, it will be extremely clear what the basis should be. But in practice, often you end up trying this kind of thing. Yeah, you think about, you try to think about features that uh, is predictive. Okay. So you, this happens in, Power, right? So power, you try to think about, you know, does voltage matter? Does active power matter? Does reactive power matter? All this goes into this sort of 
processing algorithms. And I want to think for the best. Right, and uh, so basic, so right, so the idea is you have different basis functions, right? So you can have, uh, you know, linear polynomial, Gaussian, sigmoid, whatever. Um, I'm not going to bother writing this out, but just different kind of basis functions. So really what we want to do is we want to keep this weight to be linear. Okay, so your computer's job is figuring out this matrix. Your job is trying to select this thing. As often there is a difference between. Any questions with this idea? Okay, yeah, so, so selecting this is actually important. Again, you know, often there's many reasons why you have to do this, right? So you know, sometimes we measure a lot of data. You cannot save all the data. You have to do pre-processing. Often your job is trying to think, you know, how do I compress the data? Often you have to just scale it differently and things like that. So it's different basis. This is this is very much a problem dependent. This part there's no universal way to choose it, right? So often as you know, if you know some reasons, you can choose different ways. Right? So. For example, communication, if you have seen this, this is cross entropy between two things. So this is this are this is mutual information between two things. So you'll see the log basis being picked a lot in communication. In power systems, we don't have logs. We have cosines and sines and multiplications and things like this. A lot of people now trying to do sort of gas systems, trying to do predictions. Then you have the used ideal gas law. So, so this is really just trying to error and building up experience. So that's really not something that you can look at and directly tell what should you use. And there are people whose research is entirely on um, if I want to work with power systems, what are the right basis functions? What are the functions I should choose? Okay, so the basis functions, they all look different, right? So this is showing you different, for example. So basis function really makes a big difference. Is they reshape the data in very different ways. Right? So this is polynomial. This is basic linear, quadratic, cubic, and higher order polynomials. This is Gaussian. So this is you just have this sort of Gaussian curves. This is sigmoid. So between minus one and one, all all different types of bases. So we'll see a lot of this. We'll see quite a bit of this. So the spaces, even when later we'll cover neural networks, you can even think of neural networks this way. And it's basically, it's just, uh, there's a bunch of bases, uh, you choose some weights and uh, some alpha comes out. Okay, so there's a, a good or bad basis actually makes a difference. Okay, so when neural networks, again, you have to, nowadays if your neural network has to be, needs to be competitive, there's some engineering you have to do to this kind of basis. And again, different application is different. Right? So something like large language models use different architectures than a good low forecasting algorithm. Yeah, so people have tried to use transformers to do low forecasting. They're not terribly successful. So they're very successful on dealing with different language, not too successful in low forecasting. Yeah, so low forecasting has its own neural networks that works. All it comes down to is there's different architecture, different bases, and uh, different applications work differently. Okay. Any questions for this linear regression? So most prediction in this class comes down to truth of basis, find the words. It works for linear regression, nonlinear regression, neural networks, SVM, things like this. Okay, so. You know, you through doing the homework, they will be very familiar of how to find W. That won't be a problem. Really, what happens in practice is not finding W; it's choosing those kind of basis factors. Right? So now that's a good, very problem dependent. It's hard to say what always works, what does. Yeah. All right. So, there's no question then. Let's take a five minute break. Then we'll do a quick review of power system. At least look at what the circuits look like. What do I mean when I talk about power? Okay. So this is very quick. 
is not a power system class, but uh, we'll just do, you know, 40 minute of review on power system. Yeah. Okay, so let's take a five minute break, then we'll start with it. Yeah. Okay, all right, so let's get started again. We're gonna look at the uh, basic power system. So I'm gonna assume that we have all same circuits, at least AC circuits. Right, so circuits where you have an AC uh, sinusoid. Okay, so I'm going to assume that. Uh, if you haven't seen circuits, there's sort of many, many books you can read about this, but again, we don't require very difficult circuit knowledge. Okay, so it just, yeah, so as long as you have seen phasor analysis, you know what happens to a capacitor under AC circuit, it's fine. Okay, so that's a requirement, what I'm assuming. But people who have not seen that, this kind of AC circuit analysis. Okay, so I'm gonna assume everybody knows uh, those things. Okay, so my power system at this level is sort of nothing but AC circuit. Essentially, it has generation. Okay, so as some specific uh, voltage and frequency. So your generators can maintain voltage, can maintain frequency. You have some load that consumes power and you have a transmission Lines basically, those are the transmission lines you see. I transmit power around. And so, real systems are sort of more complicated. So, often, this you have to keep this in mind when you work with real system as so there's a lot of right, so there's no ideal sources. So, that means frequency and the voltage change. Okay, so that's a lot of my research is actually to do what happens when frequency and voltage change. So we have 60 hertz system. If it's not 60 hertz, because a disturbance on the system, what do you do with it? Okay, so how do you deal with it? That's one thing. Two is the transmission lines. are not wide. Okay, so you cannot think of transmission line really like a wire, that is a metal wire. What a transmission line really looks to us as a resistor plus an inductor. Okay, so that's why a transmission line actually is. Right, so resistance comes from the fact that, it's a, you know, you have some losses in heat, right? So push current through the line, you have heat. That's resistance. Inductance comes from the fact that you're operating AC circuit. There's coupling between the line and even ground on different phases of the line. You have an inductor on the lines. System has redundancy. So the system is designed to, right, so the system is designed to withstand uh, disturbances or outages. Okay, so lines go out again all the time, right? Your system designed to actually withstand this kind of outages. Then uh, again, we often don't know the real model. Okay, so we yeah we have some model that we have in mind, but those models are not always realistic, right? There are some models parameters that we don't know. Okay, so these are things to keep in mind. And so there's learning or machine learning being applied to all this kind of thing. For example, there's this very hot. Right now in research is to use machine learning to determine what is the right redundancy in the system. Okay, so having redundancy in the system is actually very expensive. So there's a lot of learning to determine this. These are sort of more challenging topics. In this class, often we down to is how do you find the right model? Again, you have data measurements, can you identify what the real model, what the system, real model for the system is based on that, then figure out and you know, solve the other problem. Okay. Okay. And the uh, notations, again, Eunice says, what uh, uh, we'll be talking in this term units in this class very often. So Again, power is instantaneous consumption of energy, right? So watt is normally the unit you have for power. Watt is a way too small unit for us. The watt is a tiny, tiny unit for power, right? So when there's nothing that's a watt, 
in the system. And so most often we'll talk about kilowatts, megawatts, gigawatts, which are the more reasonable numbers we'll see. Okay. Again, so ballpark number to remember, again, is installed US generation is about 1,000 gigawatt. Okay, so one terawatt, basically, of power that's installed in the US. It doesn't mean everything is turned on. Okay, we never turn everything on at the same time, but this sort of the maximum amount of power we can generate. That's about a terawatt of power that can be generated at any one time. Okay, so it turns out to be about three kilowatts per person. Right? So that's the install capacity we have. So for California, that's a peak of around 100 gigawatts. So how does the state of California? is about you know, one tenth of this peak, right? Yeah. Oh, this number? So this is 1,000. I thought I would write it better. So one zero 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 gigawatt. So a terawatt of generation capacity in the US, California has about 100 gigawatt of uh, power. Okay. Right, so again, just saying that, you know, if you see a gigawatt, it, it doesn't mean there's a terribly large number. It just the way, just a watt turns out to be a very, very small number for us. Okay. So now we can talk about energy, right? So we have power, we have energy. So again, for energy, Joule is a, extremely small number that we never use. Okay, we never talk about this locus of how many joules of energy. It's way too small a number for us to even think about. Right, so what to look at most often is kilowatt hour. For residential, we talk about terms of kilowatt hour. For larger things, we'll talk about megawatt hour, gigawatt hour, this kind of uh, thing, okay? So we'll talk about, uh, you know, BTU as a unit you'll see, uh, especially in the US, or MBTU is something you'll see in the US, right? So again, right, so you talk, talk about, so for electric vehicles, for example, often you want to do this kind of conversion. So one tank, one gallon of gas is about 30, 36 kilowatt hour. And so that's, if you want to say, compare a gasoline vehicle versus electric vehicle, and compare how much power it has, that's a useful number to remember. Okay, so 10 gallons of gas, so you have a standard car, 10 gallons of gas, that's about 360 kilowatt hour okay, of how much power you have in that gas. So if you want to have an equivalent electric vehicle in the battery, that's about 360 kilowatt hour. Okay, so that's the idea of conversion. Right, so this is a useful number to remember. Again, remember that kilowatt hour is actually a lot of joules. Okay, again, if anybody ever shows you in power something measured in joules, that means something is wrong with our calculation. Okay, joule is almost a unit we never see in actual uh, in, in system like practice. Okay, so this is energy and power. The thing to remember is when you pay money, most people. Pay for both power and energy. Okay, so when you get a bill, right? So you may think it's very intuitive while you're paying for energy. This is how much power you use over time, right? So I say, you know, something, you have a generation, is some cost money to generate energy, so you're paying for energy. But you also pay for the instantaneous power you use. So why is that? I think the reason why, is, for example, if you get your bill, especially if you're a reasonably large customer, you not only pay for the energy, the integral of power usage, you're also paying for the maximum peak power, for the peak power you have used, that's over a month. Often your bill is actually dominated by the power component, not so much the energy component. Now, even though power is just for instantaneous energy, Right. So let's say you use very high power 
for an extremely short amount of time. Whereas, that, so you have a very small energy portion. Your bill is actually quite large for that. You have a fairly large bill because you use PayPal. Anybody know why? All right. It's the right, so I only use it for a very short amount of time, right? It's a tiny bit of time, but why am I still being charged money? That's why I use, you know, 100 kilowatts for one second. That costs you a lot more than you say you use one kilowatt for an hour. Although the second is long, like the, the second case is longer energy. Right? No, not right. Right? Create load on this? Not really. So think about when you build a system, right? When you construct a power system, do you make the system for the average power consumption or the peak power consumption? Think of way when you use power. Does it ever happen when you try to turn the light off? Somebody tells you, oh, no, I can't do this. You know, I only construct the system for the average case, right? So, Basically, what you see is there is you don't ever observe any congestion in the power system. Okay, so when you try when you have transportation, when you travel, I say over five twenty, there's be a traffic congestion. It takes you two, one hour to get to to that. Right? We don't build a bridge for the maximum number of possible cars on um, that can ever pass through. The way we construct power system, we always construct system to the peak power possible. Okay, so if, you know if you can ever consume. For California, right? So California doesn't get to 100 gigawatt. California may get to 100 gigawatt for an hour every year, but the entire system is constructed to deliver 100 gigawatt. Right? It's not constructed to deliver the average. So because the infrastructure costs so much money, right? building infrastructure costs so much money, and that's why you pay for peak power. Okay, you pay, you pay for peak power because the infrastructure is made such that peak power can be delivered to. Okay, so the system, the power system is very special in the sense that we don't care about the average case. Power system, you always care about the peak one. Okay, nobody ever talks about the average case. The average is not important. You care about the worst case, you care about the peak load. You construct, you offer your system such that the peak load happens. You offer your system such that, you know, the worst case happens. Okay, so you always construct for the peak. This is very different than something like transportation, okay? or even internet. When you, you know, for internet, nobody tells you, hey, no, we all download something together, you still have the same speed. Right? That's not a problem. Okay? In fact, that happened in this university when we're Zooming, everybody was Zooming, but too many people Zooming on, on campus will crash the campus internet infrastructure. Okay, so we crashed that. But the power system is not supposed to crash. Okay, so the thing to remember is, power system has to work for the peak power consumption. Okay, so that's why if you're a large customer and you have a large peak, most of the bill is actually on the peak power side, not so much on the energy usage side. Okay, and so this is, right, so, yeah, so this happens actually quite often. This is actually a very important consideration. Right, so for electric airplanes, for example, we are, you know, very, State of Washington is sort of pretty, you know, leading sort of state in electric airplanes. We're constructing a lot of electric airplanes. Where do you think we charge them? Anybody know? Where do you think we charge electric airplanes? You can't charge in Seattle. We don't have enough peak power. Like electric airplane takes a lot of power to charge. They charge pretty fast within, you know, an hour, but it takes a lot of power. Right. So we charge electric airplanes around Moses Lake, for the people who know what that is. And the reason we do it there, for some reason, Moses Lake has a very good transmission line to it. And not many people are using power. So we charge electric airplanes there. And you have manufacturing there as well. And so power, again, sorry, this is a huge, huge thing you have considering. Really, in power system is a peak power. The average is not all that important. Not many people are working on the average. Most of you work on the peak, right? It's something to keep in mind for the system operation. So if you learn, right, so this will happen later in the classes, we'll get a building, we'll say what is the, you know, we use reinforcement learning to say what is the best way to control the building. Our cost function is not gonna be on energy, 
or not only the energy. Our objective function will actually be the peak power, okay, which is you know, happens quite a bit in power systems, not so much in other applications. Right? So it's a sort of slightly different objective and you think about you know, how to learn with that objective and so on. Okay? So that's something happens for us. Right, so power system again happens all over the place, right? So, you know, power system can apply to utilities, uh, which is where, where you should be most familiar with. You know, a lot of things we say can apply to airplanes and spaceships, really. Actually, quite a bit of airplane engineering is power. Spaceships also, power delivery is a big part, right? So just at different frequency. Electrical vehicles, again, Quite a bit of what's inside electric vehicles is a power delivery system, right? And uh, you have battery operation. So many things we're saying will give some examples, but you can equally apply the algorithm to many other examples. So EVs is a good example. You can sort of optimize the power quite a bit, power infrastructure quite a bit within it. Okay. So now, just for understanding, look at the, the big North American system. So North American system is made up of two, four systems, actually. So from an electric point of view, North America is four different parts. We are the Western interconnect across, this is basically for Rockies. This is the Eastern interconnect. So this interconnect means that everything here is connected. These two systems are essentially separate. So whatever happens here has nothing to do. What happens in green has nothing to do with blue. Okay, so if, for example, if we run out of power, this blue system cannot provide us power. They're not electrically connected. There's no lock between the two. Okay, so just two separate systems. Texas is its own system. Quebec is its own system. Okay, because reasons this happened to be this way. Okay, so. These people coordinate, this people coordinate, Texas essentially lives on its own, Quebec lives on its own. So if you know the history of Canada and the US, then you can have a very good guess of why Quebec and Texas ended up being their own systems. Okay. Any questions about this setup? Okay. Yeah, so from an electric perspective, this is all one system. So this is all one system. So power from BC Hydro flows to Canada, flows to California, to us regularly. So there is really no risk, not much restriction to power flow within the system. Okay, so this is all one, this one, essentially one, one big electric system. Okay, okay. Oh, which of them have more nuclear power? Uh, this has way more nuclear power. This is this is, has a lot more nuclear power. California have some, not that much. They have a lot of nuclear here. Texas essentially have none. Quebec essentially have none. Right, so Quebec is mostly hydro. This is mostly hydro. Texas by far has the most wind in the entire, essentially maybe the world as a standalone system that has the most wood. Okay, so this is heavily nuclear gas co-dominated. This part is nuclear plus hydro plus gas. So various system has sort of different mixes depending on where you are. But uh, yeah, so that just, for historical reasons, you know, you would think, you would think, you know, maybe US is one system, Canada is one system, just not the way everything is connected. So for example, if a blackout happens, it could be a blackout by out this whole part. Potentially. Right. So that's the system setup. Questions for this? Okay, so there's, uh, right. so that's the system setup. So Texas is nice, that's because later we'll see a lot of data comes from Texas, actually. But by far has the most wood. And Texas has not much regulations. So anything you come up with, you can try actually in that system. So whereas in Seattle, for example, we have one utility. Right? So if you live in Seattle, it is Seattle City Light. You have no choice. If you live outside Seattle, it's probably Puget Sound Energy. That's your utility. Then you have no choice. 
right? You pay whatever they tell you to pay. Texas, you go there, if you live in Austin, you can choose from about 100 different utilities, all with different rate plans. You can negotiate, you can pick. It's like a cell phone choice, basically, you live in Texas. Okay, so there's a lot of interesting data that actually comes out of Texas, and uh, we all work with data. So a lot later, we'll have one data, a lot of it coming out of Texas. Right? So it's quite interesting. So this is actually, from electricity point of view, this is a very progressive system, extremely progressive system. They let you try everything. Like the, whatever rate plan comes off, the Texas will allow it. Right? We're asking, you know, City so Light is basically whatever city council decides to do. Okay. All right, so we're going to do a very fast review of our phasers and AC systems. Uh, mostly to make sure that when I say voltage, power, and current, you know what I mean when I say things like voltage. Right, so the time domain signals we have in our system is something like this, V max, cosine omega t plus theta V, right? So this is the time domain voltage. Right, so it's, for every signal we have in this class, it's always a sinusoid at some fixed frequency, omega, some angle, some phase offset, right, theta v. Okay. So what is the value of this number for a North America system? Right? So is it 50 or 60? Right, for us, it's 60. So omega for us is, this is 2 pi times 60. Right. So it's 277. Right. So this is the number that's setting still. Okay, this is the constant that's plugging. This is what you can change. Okay, so when you're generating voltage, you don't get to choose the frequency. You gotta choose the angle offset of this voltage. Okay, so frequency is fixed. So again, the answer to what happens if the system is not at 60, for example, if you try to run a, say, a gas generator at 59 hertz, what happens is that thing blows up. Okay, so this is really at 60. So bad things happen if this is not at 60. Okay, so there's sort of good reasons why this is a fixed number. Okay, so for a current, again, same thing, right? So. You can determine this magnitude. This is to, you can control this. You can control the angle offset. You, you don't touch the frequency of the thing. Okay. So, right. So when I say the voltage, for example, in this room coming on the wall socket is 120 volt. What does that mean? Which of this number is 120? Okay. So that's the RMS, right? The thing to remember is when we talk about the voltage being some value. We're not talking about this number. Okay, so the, when we say the voltage is 120, when we say the voltage is a is for 377 kilovolts, things like this, we don't talk about that magnitude. What we talk about is root mean square voltage. So this is RMS is you take the root of the mean of the square signal, you integrate this thing. This is V max over square root of T. Okay. So this is the voltage that we talked about. Okay, I think all in all power systems, when you say the voltage some value, we're talking about this number, this root mean square. Okay. So, so I'm assuming we have all seen this before, right? So everybody has seen root mean square somewhere in the circle. So you have not seen that? You see, I see. Okay, yeah, yeah. So this, again, when we talk about things like voltage, we're talking about the root mean square value. Okay. Current, the root mean square current. Okay, so we don't really talk about the magnitude of this. Okay, that, that's not common. That, that's not a common number to talk about. All right. So phasor notation is basically to say that since everything has the same frequency, I'm too lazy to write the frequency. So we're not just going to write the frequency. Okay, so the phasor notation is in, so phasor in root mean square is if I have a voltage signal, I'm gonna think about as a magnitude 
plus angle deviation. I'm going to want to hide this omega t number around. Right? So omega t is some common frame of reference that really doesn't enter into uh, any, uh, uh, and that really doesn't enter into the picture. So when we talk about voltage current, we'll talk about voltage and current phasers. So these are complex numbers with some magnitude and some angle. Okay. So that's how we think about quantities in the system. Okay. We have phasers. We reference them to this omega t. Okay. So the nice thing about working with phasers, again, is we have capacitors and inductors. You don't need to deal with the differential equations. Right. It just because everything is at the same frequency, so capacitors and inductors doesn't change frequency of the signals. So you never care about the frequency part. So you can just work with numbers. Okay. So, for example, if you have uh, you know resistor, uh, or you have inductor governed by this differential equation, or capacitor governed by this differential equation, in phasers, these all become algebraic. Calculation. So you can avoid solving this derivative differential equation or doing the integral. The whole thing is just because nothing in the system changes frequency. So past sinusoid through all the things, it doesn't change frequency. Okay. All right. So now we can define this Z as impedance. So this is just that R plus Jx, right? So, and this is called, also have the phaser notation associated with it. Okay, so this are the uh, impedance we can define. So you have any a circuit that looks like, this is equivalent to some Z. That you define. Right? So we're not going to do much circuit calculation. When we talk about the line, we're talking about this complex impedance of a line. Okay. So an interesting fact is, you know, the impedance is actually higher than for the exact same physical component. The impedance is higher in North America compared to Europe because we're a sixty hertz system; they're fifty hertz. So oh, this thing gets multiplied by a bigger number. Yeah, so it depends on the frequency of the system you're operating at. <laughs> so, but uh, this work do everything in circuit calculations. Okay, so just do a very quick calculation for this type of circuit, uh, mostly as a reminder, right? So let's say I have a circuit of some voltage that's a sinusoid, I pass through a four ohm resistor, 7.96 millihenries inductor, you know, compute what the current is. Okay. So the way to do this is again, you would do everything in terms of the uh, phaser notation. Right. So you want to ignore omega t. So you think of the current phase, the voltage phaser is 100 and go 30. So this 100 comes from taking this magnitude divided by root two, right, this 100. Angle 30 degrees come from this offset of 30 degrees. You now this angle 30 degrees here. Any question about this? There's no square root two. Because in phase three, we only talk RMS. Right, but here, see, that's the, right, so this is a time domain signal. When I go from the time domain signal to a phasor notation to a complex number, you divide the this thing goes down by square root of two by definition. The magnitude of the phasor is the magnitude of the time domain signal divided by root two. Okay, so when we talk about phasors, this is the RMS. This is the RMS voltage. Okay. It's just RMS voltage, okay? So there's no square root of two here, right? So the angle is just, you read off this angle here. Right, so now you can write down what the uh, impedance is, right? So the impedance, Z, is R plus Jx, 
Here R is four ohms. This doesn't change. Plus J X X as a frequency times the inductance. Times the L inductance. Okay. So this you can plug in. This is two pi sixty. This is seven point nine six millihertz. Okay. So you can construct a complex impedance this way, and then your current, which is V over Z. Okay, so it's just a complex number division. This will give you this is twenty angle minus six point nine. Okay. So all these are complex numbers for us. Voltage and current are complex numbers. Any questions? So this is the end point. Okay, so if your homework ever asks for this kind of calculations, it's okay to just say the end result. As it's simple enough, you don't need to show your work for this kind of calculations. You can just say where the answer is. Yes, right. And it doesn't matter what software you use to do this calculation. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. So, right, so the V max is 100 multiplied by square root 2, right? When you convert from time to mean to phase to this complex phaser, so this magnitude goes down by square root two factor, right? We only use the RMS voltage. Yes. yes. Right. Yeah, the root two cancel factor. Yeah. 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 So the angle is thirty, right? So you read off this plus thirty. Okay. Any other questions? Okay, so now comes a slightly tricky part. It's power, right? So you can define, right? So, you know, angle, voltage and current being complex numbers seems fine. The tricky part is always what to do with this power thing right now you have. And so what we have is we have the instantaneous power is by definition V times I. Right? So you take the time domain voltage, Multiply the time during current, you have oscillating power. This is perfectly again. This is a uh, sort of this physics definition of power. The question is, what do you do if you have phasers? Right. Anybody remember what happens now? If I, if I have a voltage phaser and current phaser, what what do I do with power? Is this still V times I? Right, so you have real power, reactive power, right? So the challenge with that is once you have two complex numbers, you multiply them together, you still have a complex number. What does that mean, right? So power, people have trouble with, what do you mean the power is a complex number? Right? So what does that mean? So let's look at what that means. And the way it really is the following is you can multiply this too, actually. It's not terribly difficult multiplying this out. So if you multiply this, So you can just go ahead and multiply. And this you can use the double angle formula for this. And uh, you, what you have is you have after some algebra, this is V max over square root two, I max over square root two. Okay. And just this one half comes out this calculate when you reduce this form. And this is again the RMS voltage, RMS curve. So. As again, why RM, we just use RMS for phaser. As naturally, you have a factor of square root two when you just multiply two kind of forms together. You have the following thing. You have a cosine of theta V minus theta I. So this is a term that comes out plus cosine of two omega T plus theta V plus theta I. So this is just the, so just, you can show this as exactly that, okay. So now there's two terms, 
in this case, right? So when you multiply two sinus lines together, what happens is you get a constant term depending on the angle difference. You get an oscillating term that's oscillating the choice of frequency. So now if you look at this power is, if you average this term across time, what happens is this thing averages out to zero. Yeah, so that's the thing to recognize, right? So if I look at the average power, then because this is a sinusoid, right, going both positive and negative, this thing has zero average, okay? So what define average power, so now let's look at it as the average power It's called P, okay? So it's not a function of time, we're just gonna average this thing. So what is it? This is just the V times I times cosine, okay? So this is just when you average this, right? So these are the RMS quantities. Again, in phaser, we just use RMS. It's gonna be this root two is built into it. So this is the, RMS, RMS, times the cosine angle difference, this term doesn't show up in the average. Right? So this is the average of the active power, okay? So now this definition, basically you, you make this observation. Now you ask the question is, if, you, if I take a phaser, how do I get this number out of it? Okay, so that's the question now you ask. You basically do this calculation. Now you look at your phasers. You say, okay, so I don't want to do this time domain calculation, right? I want to work just with complex phasers. So let's say that you have V, voltage phaser is angle theta V. You have a current phaser, this is angle theta I. How, what do you do to these two together look like this? How do you get this sort of cosine theta V minus theta I to come out? No, power doesn't need to be positive, right? So power can be, right? So you have a generator and load. Let's say the generator has positive power, low has negative power. So that's, that, that's perfect. But you can consume the power. So if the sign is positive, normally you're producing the power. If the sign is negative, you're consuming the power. So that's normally the sign convention we have. Yeah, so power could be negative, power could be negative. But the good news for mathematically, how do you combine these two to get something out of this out? All right? Right, but you're right. So how do I get this negative sign? How do I get theta V minus theta X? And what do I do to this to get the theta? Right, but like mathematically, what do I do? Right, so is it okay if I just multiply this two complex number together? Can I think of how, right? So here power is V times I. So should I just say, oh, some power is just V times this I? Does that work? What, what happens if I just take this and multiply this thing? Right, so if you just take this and multiply this number, this, you don't have a negative sign out here. Right? That's a problem with spacers. As you cannot take voltage multiplied by current phase. Right? This, you can't get a theta V minus theta I. You really want this idea of the angle difference for sure, I think the Right, so that's the You can change it to the regular form. before. When you multiply, it's still not theta V minus theta I. So what do you do to a complex number to, to sort of negate its angle, right? So you basically take it as a complex conjugate of this thing, right? If you conjugate this thing, then you modify it. Okay, so this is why we define complex power in the following way. So to make sure this number comes out this way, right? So this is the physical power, right? So this is what true you know, average power looks like. This is just for calculation. Okay. The phasers are nice things for us to think about, the electric uh, quantities. 
So I need to make sure whatever I do lines up with the physical interpret with actual physical power being delivered. So we're gonna make the following definition. When I say the complex power S, we're just giving it a name, right? So I have two parts, we just give the following name. This is V times I conjugate. Okay, so this is a complex conjugate that we'll take on I. The reason we take a conjugate is we want this angle to be negative. That's all I want this angle to be negative. Okay, so this is defined as conjugate V angle theta V times I minus theta. I get an angle difference out of this. That's how I conjugate the uh, current. Okay, so this is VI conjugate theta V minus theta. This is basically the angle I get. Okay. And what you observe is the real part of this complex number is exactly this. This is just pattern matching. Okay, there's not necessarily anything deep within this. As uh, so you want to get this number to come out, you have these two. So this is the way for that number to come out. This is literally pattern match. So this is P plus JQ. Okay, so you call the real part of this thing. This corresponds to the average power you get. And then the imaginary part would give some interpretation to what the imaginary part. So the complex number is nothing but that. So P, this P corresponds to the average power. This Q turns out you can do the calculation. This will turn out to be proportional. This is not exactly the oscillation to the oscillation. Okay, and uh, the name we give this P is called active power or real power. Q, this is called reactive power. Okay, so reactive power is basically just the oscillation that goes around. Active power is the average power you have. The active power is power that can actually do work. Okay, right, so reactive power, you know, again, happens a lot in the system. So how do you get reactive power? For example, you connect a sinusoidal source, let's say with a capacitor. So what happens is if you have a sinusoid source through a capacitor, the capacitor will be a sinusoid, right? Capacitor doesn't consume any power. So what happens is this capacitor basically just consumes so-called reactive power. Okay, so that's just what we have. Any questions? So when I say power, most time we're talking about active power. But reactive power also comes up in the system. Okay. So for us, again, it's, yeah. So when we do a measurement, we typically measure both active and reactive power. Okay. So we'll measure both powers. Questions about this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so when we do measurements, again, it's fairly easy to measure the voltage. It's very easy to, it's easy to measure the voltage. It's easy to measure P and Q, active reactive powers. Turns out it's not super easy to measure current. That's you know, just the way the physics works. Right, so normally when we do a measurement, we say that, at a, let's say at the wall socket, you can measure V, you can measure PQ. From that, often you try to infer what current is out of the three measurements. But typically, measuring current is actually challenging to do. Okay, so anybody know why it's challenging to measure current? Just to just finish that thought. When we have data, as often you got VPQ, which is trying to infer current. From current, trying to infer the topology or what's happening in the system. 
So why is, for example, voltage easier to measure than current? It's from a physics point of view. Right, so voltage turned out to be easier to measure is because it's very easy to get a voltage transformer. If you have a transformer, you wrap coils around it, that's your voltage transform. It's not so easy to get a current transformer, actually. So most transformers with, you think about are actually voltage transformers. The steps up, step down voltage, occur both on the transformer. Current transformers are relatively harder to construct, actually. It's much harder to think about how do I transform, let's say, 100 amps of current down to 0.1 amps, where I have a meter that can actually measure this 0.1 amps. So for those of you are who are sort of more circuit or physics inclined, think about how you will construct a current transform. I gave you a high current, how do you step that thing down to do a measurable pattern? Voltage is very easy, wrap coils. You can wrap a lot of coils on one side, not so many on the other side. You got to step down voltage transform. Current, not so easy. So that's something to think about if you're interested in you know, how the sensors work, for example. Right, so the thing just to remember is we have conservation of power in the system, right? So conservation of power is conserved for both real and reactive power. You cannot lose power. You cannot create power, really, inside the system. So this is saying that as you have a generator, you have some uh, as you have some power coming out of the source. This going through some impedance. This goes into the load. And then S is equal to the loss plus load, right? both in real and reactive power. Okay, so you cannot lose power. Right? So the po if you lose power, the power must go into a sort of going to the resistance or the inductance of the transmission line. Okay, so the thing line by itself cannot create or destroy power. Right? So that's just a simple consequence of uh, Kirchhoff's law. It's a direct consequence of Kirchhoff's law. Okay, so, right, so just to again to remember, so often when we do data data analysis, as we often put this as a constraint when doing sort of learning the topology or something about the system. And not only do we have the measurement. We have a physical equation constraining all the things we measure. So that actually makes the uh, data part easier, making the regression part easier, actually, because you have additional constraints into the system because you know all this information, right? You know the conservation of energy, right? Okay. Any questions? Okay, so we're gonna skip some of the examples really we're not and you do for analysis in the examples. So lastly, for this class is when we draw things, when we draw a power system, you'll see some in this case, we draw this thing called one line diagrams. So we'll show a generator typically shown like this. Oh, this is a little bit off center, a little bit off this. So really this thing should be in the circle. Shown like that, a load is showing an arrow, means you're drawing the load, right? So we're, this is our representation of a system. So this is called a one line diagram because all the transmission lines are one line, draw one line, okay? So what this symbolizes, this is actually a magnet, right? So generator works by turning a magnet. So you turn a magnet, you generate AC power, AC voltage, right? So this is the magnet, the showing a magnet is turning, this is generator. Okay? So load is just a load. Okay? So you see this quite a bit, right? So if you ever read a diagram, this is how you read a diagram. We'll see, you'll see a lot of this weird voltages that comes out. These are actually standards. So for re reasons that I don't know about, is we end up with some like 59.7 kV as a standard voltage in the system. Right? These are just number, typical numbers you'll see. I'm not quite too sure why these are numbers, but you'll see this kind of the voltage come out. So again, one thing we'll say is about that you now most systems are three phase, right? So most the actual system you see over, out there in practice are three phase. If you never heard about this, it's fine, don't worry too much about it. Basically, 
this is how we transmit power. As when you have a normal circuit, you basically have a you know, path going from the, right? so for a normal circuit, you have a path going from the generator to the load and then a return path, right? Current has to return. You have a return path. In power system, we don't transmit power that way. The way we transmit power is you have a, basically we transmit in a so-called balance three phase system. As you have three generators all coming together, all transmitting some power. And then you have three different loads all connected to the three generators. This is actually how we transmit power in the power system, right? So the reason we do this is to avoid a return path. So normally when you have three generators and three loads, you know, I, you need six wires, right? You need the wire going there, coming back, wire going there, coming back. This is a way to avoid using the return wires. This comes from the reason this comes from the fact that there's a way to cancel sinusoid. There's a way to have destructive interference in sinusoid such that when you add them up, there is zero for going through. So I don't need a return path. And so, Really, the idea is if I have IA, IB, IC as IA, and let's say I cosine omega T, IB as I cosine omega T minus two pi over three, omega T plus two pi over three, then in fact, all of these things sum up to zero. Okay, so if you offset each of the wires, each of the lines by a factor of two pi over three, so 120 degrees, if you offset things by 120 degrees, when you add this thing up, it's actually zero. Okay, this is identically zero. There's just, there's just everything cancels. Okay, so this is identically zero. So this is, you sum across this, this is zero, so I don't need a return path. There's no current. And from the conservation of charge point of view, there's no net current actually delivering the system. Okay, so there's no net current. I don't need a return path. So I can save some wires in the system. Okay, so we are not going to worry too much about the fact there are three wires because all of these things are basically the same except the phase of them. Okay, so we're going to assume for us, it's okay to do one of them. What it ends up doing is you multiply everything by three. There are three of them. You We're not going to worry too much about it. Just remember that in practice, when you, when you go and when you see a transmission power, you don't count the number of lines. They always come in multiple of three because of the three phase system back there. Yeah. So this is actually a big, this is actually important innovation to, to observe this. So this is a huge important. Again, because how hard it is to have a Y. Okay, so a lot of effort is trying to make sure they stay, they're sort of, they're balanced. They stay exactly this space different. Okay. So we're gonna assume this is always true and then not worry too much about the exact space of the system. Any questions about three things? So if you take a power, actual power system analysis class, you're spending a month on this three phase. So here we're just, Stipulate this is true. Oh, yeah, go ahead. Let's see. Uh, okay, so this is omega. So this is this is the frequency. Okay, so this is oh C A B C A B C A B C phase A phase B phase C. Oh, three, three. This is three. This is the angle. It's, two, it's 120 degrees. Right? So two pi over three. It's 120 degrees. Okay. Yeah, so this is offset by 120 degrees. Oh, okay. So they add up. Any other questions about three things? Okay, so this is a three phase system. And uh, right, so we'll end the class by looking at. So different goals for renewable, right? So 
Uh, one reason power system is important nowadays is you want to renewable integration. And uh, you know, I guess a major reason why data has become important is also to support renewable integration. Uh, the old system works fine without much uh, data science. Right? So the system in the 80s works fine. There's very little data science. Okay, so the reason you need some data science and one of the systems becoming sort of more challenging to deal with is Right, so you have different levels of renewable integration. So this is a picture by DOE. This is this is an official picture by Department of Energy. And it's the thing that you know how hard is it to go up, right? So this is hundred percent renewables. Not many places are hundred percent renewable. Hawaii, some island in Hawaii is hundred percent renewable. But if you look at you know the big things, right? Continental US, not very good, not even below fifty percent. So the idea is getting to 25% renewable is relatively easy. It's not a huge challenge. Getting to 50 is challenging. Getting above to say 70%, this is extremely challenging. Okay, so using existing tools, we can probably get to 25% renewable without all that much difficulty. Getting this, you need to bring new tools. Data science, for example, is one of such that can help here. For example, just better forecasting. Better wind forecasting is important here, right? Not to only to mention other part of system operations. Okay, and then going up and up is even more challenging. So really, if you look at the research happening, where the machine learning something is basically trying to go up the range. Okay? And if you look at some circles here, basically Denmark claims are forty percent renewables. This is by cheating. What happens is Denmark connects to the rest of Europe. So Denmark, if Denmark needs power, just draw power from the rest of Europe, right? So this is a little bit cheating. Was, you know, they were 40% renewables. <laughs> this happens because they're connected to Finland. They're connected to Norway, to Finland, to Germany, to France, right? So, uh, so you, continental USA is harder, but this is, you know, moving the whole system up is much, much harder to do. And if you look at the trend of generation, now, what has renewable been doing, right? What does renewable do in the US? Uh, so the plot here is up to 2020. This is the renewable line. Okay. What renewable did is basically renewable has overtaken coal. So this basically in renewable and natural gas, you essentially make coal not competitive in the US. The US, you cannot make money by, off by make sort of operating coal power for anyone. The coal is going down, this is not gonna come back. Right? So renewable, so the easy part has been done. And the reason this is 21% renewable is this includes hydro. Okay. Still for the US, most renewable is hydro. Right? We are 100% renewable because we're 96% hydro. Right? So Seattle claims we're 100% renewable. Again, you know, you win by default. We have this much hydro, so we win. Right? So this is the easy part. So renewable has speed and coal, this is for sure. What happens to natural gas and renewable is unclear. Okay, so you want to look at the growth trend, natural gas is growing at a faster pace than renewable. So if really for the next second, nuclear is not gonna change all that much. Even though we start building nuclear, not much will happen in the next 10 years. Retirement is not, we don't have that much retirement. Coal is gonna to continue to go down. The question is, if this thing goes down, this 20%, does it go to renewables or does it go to natural gas? That's sort of unclear what's gonna happen right, in the system. Okay, so, uh, you know, in this class we'll learn all the tools, but uh, you know, very high level basic thinking is how to use the tools from data science, from machine learning, from other things, you know, to make sure that you know, coal is going to go to zero, relatively sick in the US. Where does this 20% go? Right? Does it go to renewable or does it go to natural gas? That's a question. When I think of a lot of the problems we're gonna have in this class is motivated by the fact that we have renewables. Right? So make things you know, more challenging, but also sort of more interesting for the class. Okay. So let's end the class uh, here today. So the next homework will be posted uh, probably by tomorrow. I already made it, so I'll make sure I made it. Made this one already, so I made the next homework uh, post by tomorrow. But again, will be due you know, next Thursday.
Okay, so any questions, uh, feel free to email me and ask. All right, so with that, let's end uh, here today.